like numbers. Even people that hate math like numbers. So when a theory comes along that illustrates a number-based relationship, that theory has a good chance of becoming popular. Enter Johann Daniel Titius. Titius was an 18th century Prussian professor who translated Charles Bonnet's Contemplation de la nature. I don't speak French. From French to German. In his book, Charles Bonnet mentions how many planets were known at the time, but in the translation, Titius noted that there was a unique relationship between all of the planets that were known in the solar system at the time. He said that if you divide the entire solar system into a hundred units, the Sun being at zero and Saturn, which was the last known planet at the time, at a hundred, starting from Mercury, the planets basically double in distance. So Mercury Mercury is at 4. Venus is at 7, but it's 3 plus 4. Earth is at 10, which is 6 plus 4. Mars is at the 12 mark. Jupiter is the exception. Jupiter doesn't double from Mars. It is at the 48 plus 4 mark, which quadruples. And Saturn is at the 96 plus 4 mark, making it 100. So basically, they all double in distance from each other except for Jupiter, which quadruples. The obvious explanation? There's a planet in between Mars and Jupiter. There must be! Numerology demands it! Sadly, no one found anything between Mars and Jupiter for decades. In the meantime, though, William Herschel, whose last name sounds German, but he's actually British, discovered discovered Uranus, and Uranus was at the 192 mark. 96 plus 96 equals 192. So everyone went, ah, oh, the Tidius Bode Law. That is so cool. Now, Johann Ellert Bode of the Tidius Bode Law, it didn't come up with the law, but he popularized the law. And so for that, we call it the Tidius Bode Law. Herschel named Uranus after George III. Yes, that King George III. He named it Georgium Sidus. And not only did the rest of Europe go, that's egocentric and Britain-centric, and we don't like that, but it completely busted up the naming convention, which was after Romans and Greek gods. It was Johann Ellert Bode of the Tidius Bode Law who suggested that Uranus be named after the father of Saturn. Uranus, who was the god of the sky. And what a fabulous father figure he was. He locked his children inside the earth to ensure that they would never usurp his power, but didn't stop making them. Only his son Saturn, the god of time, was willing to put an end to Uranus's barbarity and uh, cut off his father's child-making bits and flung them into the sea because he didn't want him to have more children. Thus getting rid of Uranus's chance to ever make children and abuse them again. To be fair, though, Saturn wasn't much better. He ate his children. Father of the Year Award, right there. It wasn't until 1801 that a guy named Giuseppe Piazzi, I believe I'm saying his name wrong, discovered a star that was moving. This happens with planets. This is actually how people knew the planets were different from stars, even though they didn't actually know what they were. Planets move in the sky. The reason Orion always looks like Orion is because in relationship to each other, the stars don't move. Orion's belt doesn't actually actually move around. His feet, his arms, his shoulders, his belt, it's always going to be in the same place. But if Saturn is under Leo's foot, it won't stay under Leo's foot. It wanders around in the sky. In fact, the word planet means wanderer in Greek. So people knew that planets were wandering around the sky and that they were different than the stars long before they knew what planets were like. But by the 1800s, people, people knew what planets were. They just didn't think they had found all of them yet. So 1801, Gisa Piazzi comes along, finds Ceres. So Ceres is right where it's supposed to be. Ceres is actually at the 24 mark. And so everyone's going, yes, we found the fifth planet, but then it didn't resolve into a disk in a telescope. And that's what happens with planets. If you actually look at Jupiter in a telescope, it doesn't remain a point of light. It starts to resolve into a disk. So even if you have a really bad telescope, you're going to see that it's a circle instead of just being this point of light. Ceres did not do that. Ceres was obviously star-like. And so the word asteroid was invented by William Herschel to describe these new bodies, and Ceres was one of them. Ceres is actually the largest asteroid in the asteroid belt. It is considered a dwarf planet. Not to be outdone by Italy, two Germans, Karl Harding and Heinrich Olbers, discovered three more asteroids, or planets as they were called at the time, in just a few years. By 1807, Harding and Olbers had discovered Pallas, Juno, and Vesta. A long period of nothing very interesting happened tonight followed until Carl Ludwig Hank discovered Astrea 
1845. Then came the flood. Between 1845 and 1900, over 400 asteroids were discovered in the main asteroid belt. So even though people knew that these asteroids were actually very, very small, which is why they wouldn't resolve into disks, but they did actually move, Olbers figured that all of this stuff had once actually been a fifth planet. So he reasoned that there had been a planet in between Mars and Jupiter at the 24 plus 4 coordinates. He called this planet Phaeton. Phaeton is named after the guy who stole his father Helios's sun chariot, decided to drive it, tried to burn up the Earth, and Zeus, you know, took him out. Heinrich Olbers probably should have let the whole fifth planet thing go. But he didn't. After all, it had been 30 years since the Tidius Bode law had been theorized, and the amazingly productive Germans, who took to calling themselves the Celestial Police, or in German, the Himmelpolizei, had found nothing except for minor bodies. You may have noticed that there was a gap between Vesta, which was discovered in 1807, and Astraea, which was discovered in 1845. This gap occurred to the Napoleonic Wars. So Napoleon, who wasn't the nicest guy ever, had this thing with the Germans. Anyway, the town of Lilienthal was basically burned and ransacked to the ground, and the observatory, which was really good observatory at the time, was sacked. And so you had this huge period where nobody discovered anything because they were too busy trying not to die. This 40-year gap gave Olbers and a lot of other astronomers 40 years to speculate on what was going on. So Aubert's had every right to speculate about this fifth planet, Phaeton, but really we know now that Phaeton probably never existed. There's a couple of problems with the Phaeton idea. Phaeton, if it had been a planet, would actually be really small. If we took all of the main asteroid belt and we crunched it together, it would probably make up about 4% of our moon's mass. And that's nothing. Pluto is 66% of the moon's mass and it's tiny. It is not considered to be a planet for a reason. We call them dwarf planets for a reason. Secondly, if Phaeton had existed, we would expect to see asteroids made of essentially the same stuff, and we don't see that. So there are several different types of asteroids in the main belt. There's carbon-rich, there's stony, and metallic. And there are a lot of subgroups. Today it's widely accepted, and for good reason, that there never was any Phaeton. There was never any fifth planet in between Mars and Jupiter, and that the main belt is simply left over from the early accretion disk. The Titius Bode Law was really well preserved in Old Bear's reasoning, until the French delivered another blow to Germany in the form of a brilliant mathematician. Urban Le Verrier was a mathematician who predicted Neptune's existence based on nothing more than mathematical data. Neptune's discovery in 1846 blew the long-lived and much-loved law to little bits. Just as the 1781 discovery of Uranus was instrumental in strengthening the Titius Bode law, Neptune did exactly the opposite. Neptune was sadly not where it should have been. Neptune should have been at the 384 mark, since 192 plus 192 equals 384, but it wasn't. It was at the 296 mark, almost 100 units off of where it should have been, according to the Titius Bode Law. Since the discovery of Neptune over 150 years ago, many astronomers have tried to make the Titius Bode Law work. They have all failed. It doesn't work. And the outlier is always Neptune. So there are really two ways to look at the Titius Bode Law. Some people still look at it today and they say, well, look at Earth and then Mars, then Jupiter to Saturn, and it really feels like there is a pattern. But the other way to look at the Titius Bode Law is we have to discount Mercury. It just doesn't count. We have to discount the asteroid belt. It does not count. And it really doesn't count if you consider how wide the asteroid belt is, too, because yes, there are asteroids in the 24 mark, but there are asteroids in the 15 mark, there are asteroids in the 30 mark, so that's, that's really cheating. And then Neptune. Neptune is completely off course. So we can't count Mercury, we can't count Neptune, and there is no fifth planet. So really, there is no pattern. There's only kind of a pattern for some of the planets. We also have not discovered the Titius Bode Law to be true for other planetary systems. So we don't look at the Gliese 581 system and go, ah yes, they all spread out in these equal distances from each other. It's pretty much just a giant coincidence. And therein lies the problem. Human beings typically do not believe in coincidences. We want there to be a pattern. We really like to organize and categorize and know that there is some sort of order in the universe. And this makes things like 
the duck-billed platypus ex incredibly frustrating and theories like the Titius bode law appealing. So Titius made these assumptions and he wasn't wrong in seeing this correlation, but when more data came in and other astronomers refused to drop the Titius bode law, they committed the Holmesian fallacy of twisting facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. However, not everything was a loss. Without the Titius bode law, the search for planets probably wouldn't have been as big of a priority in the early 1800s, and the Himmelpolizei, or the Celestial Police, never would have been organized, and the asteroid belt probably wouldn't have been discovered until much later, when instruments got better and better. So we did learn something, we did find something, and that's kind of the paradox of astronomy. Astronomy is a lot like watching Les Miserables a mile away through a keyhole and then trying to explain the plot. It's really hard, and things are really far away, so there's a lot of assumptions that are made, and a lot of times you discover things that you weren't even looking for. Nothing ever turns out the way astronomers expect them to. But in astronomy, if you're very lucky, you will live to see your pet theories crushed in order to make way for new horizons. It's good to be a geek! It's good to be a creep It's good to draw my pictures And no one will have a seat It's good to be a geek It's good to be a gnome It's good I'll never wait in Right beside the telephone This one time, the first time, well, maybe the only time, that I ever played poker, they described it to me and I realized, okay, I want things that are similar. You know, I, I want to have the king and the queen, and I want to have the jack, and I, I want to have everything similar. And that's really all I remembered. So we get down to it, and I'm just sitting there grinning, like, yeah, I got the greatest cards ever. And I knew I had a great hand. And I couldn't remember all the hands everyone told me, but I knew I had a great hand. And so finally, everybody else folds, and they, they tell me to show them my hand, and I show my hand, and I'm just like, I have the best hand ever. And I think I had a two, three, and a four, and then I had a seven and an eight. Which is nothing, <laughs> but it feels like something. That hand felt really good. I felt like I had a great hand going there. Two, three, four, they're right next to each other. Seven, eight, also next to each other. There we go. I sat there playing like I had a flush because I knew, I knew that there was a pattern in my cards. And it turns out it was worthless. That's kind of how the Tidious Bode Law works.